as many as were baptized into Christ. Ye put on the Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, our one true God. Greetings everybody, and thank you for tuning in again to hear our weekly sermon of the Genuine Orthodox Church of America. And today, <clears throat> I should say tomorrow, is the beginning of the Holy 40 Days. This is when all our faithful make a determination that they're going to struggle, they're going to afflict, our, uh, afflict themselves because it's the Holy 40 Days. The fast, the great fast, is now here. So, we have to fast as far as food is concerned, so you go into your refrigerators and take out everything that's not going to last until May 5th. That is meat, dairy, you know, eggs, all kinds of dairy products that you may have there and throw it away because you're an Orthodox Christian, correct? You're not going to eat it for over a month. So don't let it go rotten in your refrigerator, throw it away. This is what Orthodox Christians do. If you haven't eaten it all before the beginning of the great fast, then get rid of it. Because you don't want to be tempted every time you open the, open the, uh, the icebox and see these things. You know you cannot, you cannot eat them. So get rid of them. Then we have a fast from spiritual passions, all the passions, mm -hmm. that we cannot, we cannot be uh, succumb to any of them. So, fasting from food gives us strength to fast from the passions. Mm -hmm. What's the gospel for today? And today is a forgiveness, forgiveness Sunday. Because we're going on the, we want to offer God these 40 days. And we cannot go into offering God this offering if we are not like him because our Savior is a forgiving God to those who are his, to those who are his inheritance, the Orthodox. Yeah, the consequences are such. So why 40 days? Why? Why are we fasting for 40 days? Why not 30 days? Why not 50 days? <clears throat> because Adam was in paradise and he was given a, a fast to keep how many trees were there in paradise? A multitude, we don't know. But Christ told him, and yes, it's Christ that told him. So Christ gave them a commandment. Of all the trees, eat, but of this one, do not eat. And Adam told his wife, we could touch and eat of all the, all the trees, but we cannot take of this one because Christ told us that's our fast. Why did they give him a fast? To, so, so they could grow spiritually, to be obedient, to learn how to be obedient. There was also in paradise the tree of life. Adam could have eaten that. 
but Christ is the tree of life. So Adam, for 40 days, was able to obey Christ and not eat of that one tree. That, so that eventually he could eat of the tree of life. Some say that he ate of the tree of life. But there was a tree of life. And Adam could not, could not keep the commandment. He broke the fast mm -hmm. with the help of Eve, his wife, with the help of the devil. So for 40 days, was he okay? And then after 40 days, he fell. And look where we are now. We have death. We have corruption. All creation has been affected. We have hatred and not love. We have all kinds of passions. It's a shame. But we could say that's the, the fruits of disobedience. The fruits of disobedience is death. That's a monastic, that's a monastic uh, saying. Um, obedience is life and disobedience is death. Boy, did Adam learn that the hard way. And he wept and lamented outside of paradise because he was immediately expelled and he wept outside the gates of paradise. So that's why we fast for 40 days because Christ, how did he fast? He ate nothing. He drank nothing. He fasted completely for 40 days. Now you say, how can someone do that? Well, yes, not only did Christ do it, but so many other people did it in the church. It's possible. It's very interesting. And it's, it has been done so many times. We know people ourselves who, who have done that. 40 days, didn't eat or drink. But Christ, he had a strong body. The people that we know uh, became very weak, but they, they did it. Okay, so now, <clears throat> so all of us are starting the Holy 40 Days, and we fasted. We do the fast. We don't eat dairy. We don't eat meat. We don't eat eggs. But we could have other things. And then on the weekend, uh, oh, and no fish. And on the weekend, we could have sell shellfish. And on the weekend, we could have olive oil. But other than that, we don't do olive oil. We don't do dairy. We don't do meat. We don't do eggs. It is very, very doable for Orthodox Christians to fast. So, what is the Gospel for today? What is the Epistle for today? Let's read it. St. Paul is talking to the Romans. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. What does that mean? Now our salvation is nearer than when we believed. Well, when we were converted to orthodoxy, that was previously. And now, perhaps a year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, we are closer to salvation, towards the end of our lives. Then he says, The night is advanced and the day had drawn near. Let us never put away from ourselves the works of darkness. Let us put on the weapons of light. Let us walk becomingly as in the day, not in revelings and drunkenness. 
not in acts of unlawful intercourse and licentiousness, not in strife and jealousy. Doesn't that sound like our society? They are polluted by drunkenness, licentiousness, and all kinds of uncleanness. Our society, Europe, America, the things that we've seen lately, I don't know if people could have believed it in the previous generation that some things like this are going to be commonplace that a person who is born a boy can be changed into a girl. Sounds like a big blasphemy, which it is. But St. Paul says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and cease taking forethought for the flesh in regard to the lust thereof. Okay, let's leave it there and then go on to the gospel. St. Matthew, Christ says, If ye forgive men their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their transgressions, neither will your Father forgive your transgressions. Remember we said, you know, (laughs) we are Orthodox Christians. We don't want to miss the mark. The mark is salvation. So one of the things that we have to do, have to be, is a forgiving person. We have to forgive, and this is Forgiveness Sunday as we start the great, the great fast. So I, before I forget, I want to ask forgiveness from, from everybody. Please forgive me for any shortcomings. And may God forgive you all. Mm. Oh, God, <clears throat> help you to understand. Understand the faith, understand the truth. Then our Savior says, whenever ye are fasting, oh, <clears throat> so we have to fast? Yes. If you're a Christian, you have to fast. But why is it there's some churches that say, oh, that's, That's old-fashioned. You don't want to hurt yourself, they say. These are like Orthodox churches, supposed Orthodox churches, but they're ecumenists. Well, you know what that means? That means they're heretics. So the laws, the rules of the church, for them, they could change. So what what do the ecumenists do? We have 40 days of fasting for the true church, but they fast seven days. That's what they say. Oh, we're only allowed to fast seven days, or maybe the first seven days and the last seven days. And during the 40 days, they have their gatherings in the church, and what do they serve? Meat and everything else that is forbidden. But Christ is saying, whenever you are fasting, cease being as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they artificially disfigure their faces in such a manner that they might appear to men fasting. So they're not doing it for God. They're doing it so everybody else can see, oh, this man is... This man is a, is fasting. Wow. <clears throat> You're not supposed to do that. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face, that thou mightest not appear to men fasting. Cover it up. Conceal it. <clears throat> Don't let people know that you are fasting. Because you're not fasting for their approval. You're not fasting for their uh, acknowledgement in any way. You're fasting for Christ, for God the Father. 
you're obeying his laws. So, so thou mightest not appear to man fasting, but to thy father who is in secret, and thy father who seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Okay, let us stop right there. And let us go on <clears throat> to talk about this week. Now, our production crew has returned from their trip to Europe. So we were, we were having a video on the current date, mm -hmm. which is Meat Fair Sunday, which is Sunday of Forgive... No, the Cheese Fair Sunday, which is the Forgiveness Sunday. And we have today... St. Gerasimus of the Jordan. And we have an icon, don't we? Yes, we do. He took out a thorn out of a th the paw of a lion. And that lion, that ferocious lion, became like a pussycat and wanted to stay with him. That's nice. <clears throat> and when St. Gerasimus died, what happened? The lion went to his grave and just stayed there and died there. It's like the lion had so much sympathy for the one he loved. Nice. Uh, Tuesday is St. Conan the Asarian and St. Mark the Ascetic. We have icons of St. Mark the Ascetic. St. Theophilus of the 42 martyrs of, Amor, uh, of Amoria. They were 42 generals taken by the Muslims, captive. They were, cap they were taken captive uh, when they overran the city of Amoria. And instead of killing them because they were generals after they killed everybody else. See, that's what happens with Muslims. You know. If you get defeated, uh, those who surrender, you have an option. Either you become a Muslim or you lose your head. So, of course, the 42 martyrs, they were orthodox, of course. They were orthodox generals of the Byzantine Empire. <clears throat> and they would not renounce Christ. So they were put in jail and they were starved. And I don't know how long that they torment these. Do you remember? Eight years. How much? Eight years to break them. Because if we could get someone to convert, can you imagine, after we torture him and starve him for eight years, and then we really have a convert on our hands, right? A one who willfully has, has seen that Islam is worth converting to. But they did not convert, and so they were all slaughtered. And they tried many ways to convert them. Their teachers, their imams, their whatever, their high priests of the mosques, they came in there and tried to convert them, <clears throat> but they wouldn't go. And one of them is Theophilus. Theophilus, and we have Father Theophilus in the Congo, in the city of Tishpaka. <clears throat> Many years to him. Mm -hmm. The next day is St. Paul the Simple, and we have also a Paul the Simple, and he's in the monastery here. Many years to our Hara monk Paul. Then the next day is St. Theophilus, the Bishop of Nicomedia, and then the next day is the Holy 40 Martyrs of Sebast. So we had 42 Martyrs three days earlier. And now we have the, the mighty 40 Martyrs um, who um, suffered in Asia Minor and uh, performed many miracles in and around where they live in Cappadocia. St. Theodore the Recruit. Do we have a young Theodore in San Diego? No. Many years to our 
Young Theodore. It's not his name day. Huh? It's not his name day. But still, he should have many years. Yes. Okay. Okay, that's, that's the week. Now, what happened while our production crew was away? Some news had developed. Oh, but first, let's, let's go to the kiss of Judas. The kiss of Judas is in this book. And <clears throat> on page 60, I wonder if we have pictures of this, of Macarius, because this is... Um, taken from page 60. No, it's just regular print. What happened? <clears throat> Archbishop Macarius of Cyprus, a famous, famous clergyman of Cyprus, he ran for office. Oh, yeah. He said that he ran for office. Uh, being Archbishop of the Church, Maybe he thought that's peanuts, you know. I gotta run for office. I'm going I'm running for president or prime minister. I want to be number one. And this is of course is when they were in heresy. Well they were in the ecumenical movement. So this man thinking, you know, why not? If I could become president of Cyprus and also Archbishop of the Church of Cyprus, uh, we won't be or bother with a canon that forbids that. Besides, you know, I'm an ecumenist. I could do whatever I want, they would think. Okay, as president and an archbishop, he had <clears throat> in his political uh, sphere of influence, he entered into a treaty with the Latins. He entered into a treaty with the Latins, the Holy See of Vatic the Vatican, and the Republic of Cyprus decided to establish diplomatic relations and to establish an apostolic nucleo representation, as well as embassies on both sides. Wow. <clears throat> So this man, showing his ecumenism, using his ecclesiastical office, said, let's go and have diplomatic relations with the Pope, with the Vatican. That was in 1973. Now, another entry that we have here, this is 1963, 10 years earlier, right before... Athenagoras was to shoot himself by going full-blown into ecumenism. And no Orthodox Church had a mentality of courting the Latins. But one church, only one church, had this mentality, and that's the Moscow Patriarchate. Oh, yes, the Moscow Patriarchate. Why, why did the Moscow Patriarchate see a desire in fostering and promoting relations with heretics? Why did they do that? Were they Orthodox? Well, no, not really, because the Moscow Patriarchate was started and it was run by the KGB. It was Stalin's church. Stalin started it. And the bishops of the Moscow Patriarchate, just like then and now, were not chosen from their own people who were completely orthodox. No, they were part of the, the Communist Party. Oh, yes. Oh, they were part of the Communist Party. And that's why they were elected patriarch. So in 1963, <clears throat> two years before Athenagoras took all of the, all of the Orthodox and pushed them into ecumenism, the Moscow Patriarch, the Patriarchate of Moscow seeks to be first in Latinizing 
the only Orthodox Church that attended the enthronement, the installation, the enthronement, on June 21st, 1963, of Pope Paul VI. The only, the only group that sent representatives there was the Moscow Patriarchate. Then, uh, something happened to that poor guy. The Moscow Patriarchate had sent a delegation to the first period of the Vatican Council and also at the funeral, June 1963, of Pope John XXIII. The new Pope, Paul VI, sent a delegation by Archbishop Francisco and Archimandrite Christopher at the celebration in Moscow of the Episcopal 50th anniversary of Patriarch Alexis. Even in 1963, they were pushing this this uh, illicit union or communion or dialogue with the Latins. What a shame, but it's only the Moscow Patriarchate. Because up until then, the Orthodox were all in communion with each other. And then, when Athenagoras lifted the anathema in 1965, that's when the great apostasy took place in the Orthodox Church. Not only <clears throat> did the Moscow Patriarchate fall headlong, being led by communists, patriarchs, but every, every uh, patriarchate, autocephalous church, autonomous church, except for our church, uh, fell in line and lifted the anathema, the anathema against the Latins, against the Pope. We had an anathema. Can, can anathema be lifted? And the answer is no. But if you want to do things that are unheard of and make a name for yourself, oh brother. So Athenagoras made a name for himself. He did something that was forbidden. And he took the Orthodox Church into the great apostasy. So much so that everything deteriorated <clears throat> in orthodoxy, except, of course, those who had nothing to do with, with ecumenism. <clears throat> and so now we come to our time. Has ecumenism stopped? And the answer is no. Has it grown? Has it multiplied? And the answer is yes. It's like a it's like a disease. It's like a it's modern day democracy. Yes, it's like modern day democracy in the United States and in Europe, where all the people don't like the direction of their country. But the very few rulers say, we don't care. We don't care about what the people want. We are going to do what we want. And so, if you told all the people in the Orthodox Church, uh, what do you think about this new way that your bishop is saying uh, every Christian is part of the Church? They were, and if they explained that it is against the creed, it's against the fathers, it's against the gospel, it's against everything the church stands for, then all the people will say, no. But it doesn't matter. The bishops, they're in power, they keep the people ignorant, and they do what they want. Well, here we go. Not too long ago, when was it? February 29, 2024. Just half a month ago. The headline is, Spanish Catholic Priest 
says on the internet that he prays that Pope Francis will go to heaven as soon as possible, that he would die. He prays that the Pope will die and go to heaven so we get him out of our hair. A Spanish archbishop has publicly criticized a group of priests making a remark that may or not have been a joke about Pope Francis's frail health. The comment that incensed Archbishop Francisco of Toledo was made by some priests. It's not one priest, it's many priests. On a weekly internet podcast, the priest made a joke that has been understood as being about praying for Pope Francis to die as soon as possible. Well, that caught my attention. Not that they're praying that he dies, <clears throat> but that, is, that they say so he could go to heaven. Wait a minute. Yes, that's what everybody thinks. But that's not where Pope goes, where, where Popes go. Popes don't go to heaven. There's a special place for them down in the depths of the earth. Yes, now this is a controversial, controversial statement that Archbishop Gregory is going to make. He's saying that the popes go to hell. Well, of course, they are not orthodox. They are heretics. They lead over a billion, over a billion people away from Christ, keep them away from the Christ. The saints of the church have said that the popes are the forerunners of Antichrist. Next week, we're going to have the anathemas are going to be read, and not a few of them are against the Latin church and all their teachings. So, there's a special place for all the popes. Now, they may be convinced, and maybe their people may be convinced that that's, that special place is not in the bottom of hell. But that doesn't change the fact that that's, that's their lot. That's their lot. After all, what signs of holiness, what signs of holiness are there in the Catholic Church, in the Latin Church? As Orthodox, we believe and one holy Catholic and apostolic church. What does that mean? One. We say it over and over again. Christ only made one church for the salvation of the world. So why are there 50,000 or more? Who knows? And the biggest one is the Roman Catholic Church over a billion people. It's not orthodox. Is that the one that Christ made? Absolutely not. That came into existence a thousand years after Christ started his church. They left his church. So that explains how the Roman Catholics are not part of the one church. We believe in one holy Holy. What, what holiness is there in the Latin Church? Is there any holiness? And the answer is absolutely not. Well, they say, well, we have, we have statues that bleed from the eye. We have statues that cry. We have statues that drink milk. We have Fatima. We have we have Mezhogori. Aren't they holy? Aren't that holiness? And the answer is absolutely not. There is nothing, zero. There's nothing holy in the Roman Catholic Church. Absolutely nothing. We believe in one 
holy, Catholic. Now, what does that mean? Catholic meaning it's universal. The Orthodox Church is the universal church. The Catholic Church just took that name. And it's very confusing to a lot of people because it's not universal even by its name. It's called the Roman Catholic. So, Roman means Rome. I think Roman means Rome. But Catholic means universal. So it's a contradictory even in the name. But it's a faith that's not universal. The Orthodox Church is the universal church. For every generation, since the very beginning, wherever it, it has gone, it has believed the same faith, the same teaching, the same creed. That's the universal church. Then we believe one holy Catholic and apostolic. Yes, apostolic. Our church, the Orthodox Church, is apostolic. The Latin church has no connection to the apostles. When they were orthodox, yes, the apostles, Peter and Paul, died there. And for 1,000 years, they kept the faith of those apostles. But now, they threw away the teachings of the apostles. The apostles never preached such things as Pope infallibility. The apostles never preached what? Predestination. The apostles never preached what? Irresistible grace. The apostles never preached that there is a purgatory. God have mercy. The apostles never taught that people are going to burn in hell for a certain time and then come out. <clears throat> These are all false teachings. The apostles didn't go around with statues. They never preached that you could have statues. They had icons. In fact, the apostles, one of them, St. Luke, even painted the icons. So the Roman Catholic Church is not the one, the Holy, the Catholic, and the Apostolic Church. It's, that's all a person has to do is read history. And then you'll see that's how it is. So, the leader of this falsehood, where, what chance, what possible chance does he have for salvation? And because he's exalted, uh, uh, I would say the chance is zero. Because what he has to do is renounce Catholicism, and be baptized and join the Orthodox Church and that he'll, he, he may find salvation. But what are the chances of something like that happen, that a Pope will wake up? Not very, not very good. After all, he thinks he's infallible. Let's go and hear St. John of Constant. We're just continuing here with, uh, with the readings and <clears throat> He says, we are in the habit of saying, had I not looked, I should not have been tempted. Had I not heard, my heart would not have ached. Had I not tasted, I should not have desired. You see how many temptations arise from our own sight, hearing, and taste. How many have suffered and still suffer because their hearts were not firm in their good inclinations, because they Im imprudently looked with impure eyes, because they heard with ears unaccustomed to, dis 
to discern between good and evil because they greedily taste it. The senses of the sin-loving, greedy flesh, unrestrained by reason and by God's commandments, have drawn those who have fallen into them into various worldly passions. So we are approach we are in the great fast, so we have to be careful by looking, by hearing, and by tasting. Some of the temptations can come by that way. And we're going to go to the Philokalia, uh, St. Gregory of Sinai. One thing more I have to add from my own experience, St. Gregory of Sinai says, a monk can in no way succeed without the following virtues. Fasting, abstinence, vigil, patience, courage, silence, prayer, not talking, tears, humility, which generate and preserve one another. So, St. Gregory is saying, not only for monks, but also for lay people, listen to these virtues. Fasting, abstinence, vigil, patience, courage, silence, prayer, tears, humility. Those are the things we should cultivate, especially now, now that we are in the Holy Fast. Okay, God bless you all. Thank you for listening. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.